I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Well, we're certainly seeing a trend in installing solar panels on homes, but what is also growing is interest in solar farming. We're joining me in a conversation to explore the advantages and opportunities of solar farming is Dr. John Fike, Professor and Forage Extension Specialist in the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences at Virginia Tech, and thanks so much for joining the conversation. I'm delighted to be here, Bob. Well, before we get into this notion of solar farming, it's kind of obvious and I think I've seen kind of pre-pandemic and post, there's a lot of panels going in on individual homes and, um, and that's on the uh, increase nationwide. Isn't it? That's my understanding, yes. And what strikes me about that is that that is a kind of a different use when we're going to go to solar farming because that's pretty much generating power for perhaps just the home for heating and cooling. In other words, that's more limited in scope as we can move toward solar farming. Well, so the, the power systems on your home, um, your, your, that power goes from your home back into the grid. That's been made possible by what's called net metering. Yeah. And so you can measure, with net metering, you can measure your power consumption and your power production, and you can do the math, whether you're producing more or consuming more from the, the local utility. And so then the, you, you get paid kind of on the balance of that. If, if, they're, you know, if you're generating more power than, uh, than what you would normally be consuming that time. Um, you could, um, in fact, store and save that power. Let's say you were producing in excess, you could put that power into a battery. That gets a lot more expensive, you know, but you can buy these home battery systems. And I think that those technologies um, are still waiting for prices to come down uh, to f before they're more um, broadly adopted. Uh, certainly the cost of solar has come down dramatically and that's led to a lot of the um, increase in implementation of so home solar systems. Um, and so when we think about that, your motive might be to save, but it's not so much that you're investing for a revenue stream. I, mean, words, I guess it's not really, it's a whole different way of thinking. Um, yeah, right, so uh, I, uh, I don't have panels on my house yet, but I've listened to a few pitches. And uh, one of the you know, discussion points that solar companies will give you is that if you're paying for the installation of panels on your home and your uh, your power generation essentially matches what your your normal demand is, then you know you can essentially wipe out that cost. Right now, you have to pay for the panel, mm -hmm. and so what they try to do is they try to get the panel cost uh, or the payments for the panels in alignment with what your normal uh, power bill would be. But their argument then would be, or part of their argument would be, then well. Uh, we've put these panels in place and we're matching the cost with the, the current energy consumption cost at today's price. But tomorrow's price is going to be more expensive, so you're actually coming out ahead mm. because you're paying for yesterday's price tomorrow, if that makes any sense. <laughs> I'm being a little bit roundabout there. But, but the idea is that power is going to continue to increase, but your uh, purchase of panels is based on the price of the power today, and it will stay that way over the life of your 20, 25 year contract, something like that. And one would think that um, there is a time period, it's not immediate. I mean, depending upon how many panels and what have you, you may not have those panels paid for in what, um, double digit years, like 10, 12, or 13? I mean, yeah, it, I've heard it, different it, figures, and, and it, so it's. It's not my place to say how quickly or uh, you know it will take because it it depends on a lot of variables. Right. Uh, some uh, in the home solar context, some roofs are very well suited for you know panels because they have south face or maybe western face. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I would point this out to your audience. There's a there, the National Renewable Energy Lab has what's called PV watts. P V W A T T S, and you can go uh, use that as a calculator to get some sort of estimate of how much power you could generate on your house. You have a little 
cursor thing you click and put on your roof. This is where I would put the panels and you know it has some estimate based on the 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 face or you know the positioning of your uh, house relative to the cardinal directions and it gives you some estimate of how much power you could generate depending on how big you want that grid on your on your home. Um, so there there's a, th back to your question you know uh, how long is it going to take? It, it it is really very situational mm -hmm. uh, and you know you may not want that many panels. Uh, so I've got a neighbor that. He was telling me Sunday, I guess it was, he said, we're generating about 20% of our power needs. But that's been a good thing for him. So uh, that, and that was something he did several years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, so let's transition from that to kind of the notion of solar farming. I must say that in a recent trip down I-77, um, and, and I think it's the first time it really got my attention. I knew that they were clearing this field and I assume it was for agriculture. And in a recent trip, my goodness, all these solar panels, what, uh, three or four feet up in the air and, 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 and just row and row and acres and acres. And that's what really heightened my interest in terms of, because I'd heard a friend whose his investment is part of a group in terms of solar farming. So how would you define a uh, kind of solar farming well, okay. I don't know that I have a, any preset definition, so, but you're asking, so I'll try to deliver. Uh, if you're farming, uh, solar farming, as it were, um, I don't see that as a particularly or necessarily particularly agricultural endeavor mm -hmm. in, in, in the sense right. that, well, if I'm just putting out a big field full of panels, that doesn't mean I'm really farming. It just means I'm capturing this sunlight, converting it to electricity, and I'm getting paid for it. Isn't that, isn't that fantastic? Um, in the, the space that I work in, uh, we often talk about agrophotovoltaic. So the photovoltaic, you know, the solar cell, and the combination of agriculture, or APV, as we would say more, more shortly, or you know, abbreviated. And so in an APV system, we're intentionally trying to integrate some agricultural practice with the solar field, as it were. Um, and different places have different approaches to this. I think the Europeans uh, have, I would say they're probably ahead of us in, in some respects. Uh, I'm, I'm not completely uh, and intimately familiar with all the projects that are going on in this country. Uh, but some of the work that I've seen out of Europe, they're testing different um, racking systems, so the, 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 the mounting system for, for holding the panels. Uh, and some of them in, in experimental beds, not in you know, regular uh, utility scale projects, but in some of the experimental sites, they've got systems that are tall enough to accommodate a combine. And, you know, that's certainly not what you're seeing. When you go down the road, you're seeing most likely, in most cases, you're seeing a single axis tracking system that will follow the sun during the day. And in Virginia, that's typically, um, I'm trying to remember, the leading edge has got to be like three or four feet off of the ground mm -hmm. when that panel is tipped up. Um, I was in Massachusetts about a year ago, and Massachusetts has... Uh, well, they've got some solar companies that are using a much higher racking system to accommodate beef cattle, mm. whereas most of the livestock situations, which I work a lot with livestock, um, it's more common to see sheep in those settings because the sheep would be shorter than the leading edge of the, of the panel. And so to make this profitable for, if you're going to lease for the um, energy companies, um, is there a certain minimum size, uh, a number of acres? Does it vary? I'm assuming that the larger the acreage, perhaps the obviously more power can be generated, therefore perhaps more revenue. Looking at it from an investment perspective. Well, so if, if I'm on the power company side of things, uh, you know, certainly larger gives me an economy of scale mm -hmm. and it will be less expensive. I, I'm trying to remember I don't remember the scale differential now, but I remember reading that some of the larger um, installations may be 
you know, on, say on an acre basis, as much as 20% cheaper to install simply because you've been able to, you know, get that economy of scale over that large landscape. Um, in that context, though, if we're going to think about this from an agrophotovoltaic standpoint, how do you have a farm operation on that kind of scale underneath panels? I mean, it's, it's not unusual for people to have hundreds or even thousands of acres under farm management, but it's a different deal when you've got hundreds or thousands of acres that you're trying to manage as a farm under a solar panel. Um, so, so there, there's some challenges there. Uh, just going back to the European example for a little bit, thinking about the the way that they have explored this. One of the one of the uh, folks that I know, colleague that's worked on some of this stuff in Europe, you know, they've looked at things even to the level of where do I put the panels during the day? So they would control. So they're not just tracking the sunlight um, to see what's better for vegetable production underneath the panels. Uh, but you know, in my way of thinking, that's probably not going to happen in this country mm. because let's say Bob Denton wants to grow lettuce and we're going to optimize the solar panel um, movement to maximize the lettuce production underneath it. Well, if lettuce is a whole lot cheaper than power generation, what's the point? I mean, in terms of the, in terms of the return mm -hmm. to Bob Denton, solar farmer, you know, you would be thinking more along the lines of maximizing the, the return on the power investment and then if I can do something else with the land underneath it that's maybe icing on the cake but you know I, I think there are a number of things that come to, to bear in these decisions about putting solar in place and uh, it's, it's intriguing to me the, the cultural aspects that are involved uh, because many people who have spent their life on the farm think okay, I, I, I'm, I got this opportunity to put these panels in place and, you know, I could run sheep or I could do something else. How am I going to farm that land afterwards? Um, and, and I, I don't, well, it's, it's a little bit flippant, but I like to ask, well, you know, you, why, well, you could make that decision from a beach somewhere in Jamaica. If you're going to get $800 an acre from the solar panel, and you're making a hundred bucks an acre now from whatever farm enterprise. I mean, it's, it's just a very different sort of income. Mm. And so, but people who've grown up on the land, they want to preserve the land. They want to continue their engagement with the land. And panels may give them the income to do that, but panels may limit their ability to do that, or it may change what they have to do if they wanted to keep the panels in. Well, I got to say, that what, what is interesting about what you said, and, and, and little research I did trying to get a sense of what it is, I, I really didn't see that much hope that you could have anything but the panels. As a matter of fact, some of the stuff I read was basically saying that's permanently with the land, and I guess that's where it's really low, that kind of, it all depends upon the panels, and so that's an interesting concept. So, so I'm not sure I understand your question or comment. Mm -hmm. When you say all you can have is the, the panels, are you saying that the land underneath will not grow any vegetation or that it's just so disturbed it will no longer be productive or all of that or none of that? What, what are you saying? Let's see, there are three degrees of that, which is a very interesting, which, which the notion says basically if you have the solar, that is all you can do with that. Then others said, well, you've got to have some native vegetation concerns because in some areas you may be very destructive. I mean, so it's, it's kind of interesting addressing the land below the panels. You see what I'm trying to say? Yes, I do. And what's very interesting is that you're saying, well, wait a minute, you could have everything, I mean, catalog, I hadn't even thought about it, or sheep. Um, but then I think about beyond the <coughs> farming aspect of turkeys, deers, if it's land that is kind of open, it must have to be enclosed. So you are having an impact in terms of habitat as well. So there's a lot of these kind of considerations. Right. And, it, you know, and I think people of goodwill can have very different opinions about mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was talking with a, a farmer some time back and he said, you know, uh, farmers as a community are, are a very small part of our population. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
as a community, we need each other, I guess is what I should say. And so the panels in some cases have been a point of difference or division in some communities and that's, and that's disappointing. And I also think that there are, I think there are legitimate groups uh, concerned about these systems, but I also think that there are probably agents who, uh, you know, for whatever reason find it expedient for them to protest against panels and that sort of thing. And I think we have to ask these questions. What, what do we do with the land? Um, I don't want to get too deep, uh, but, y you know, as a kid, I used to remember sitting on a tractor and thinking that I'd be driving somewhere up in northern Virginia and would see all of the development. And I think, man, all this beautiful farmland is just being converted to housing. And that just hurt me. Mm -hmm. But then I'm on the tractor thinking, what do the Native Americans feel when we came in and cut everything down and plowed it up? So we've always had these kinds of, oh, I shouldn't say always, we've, there's a long history mm -hmm. of uh, human intervention with the landscape. And you know, part of the reason for uh, jumping into solar at this point is to reduce our use of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, there, there can be a very um, reasonable thought that we should try to use these systems to uh, have, a, have, a, have a better chance at fighting climate change. Um, and you know, that may not have any resonance with some people, you know, that argument may not make any sense. Uh, other, you know, people that are thinking, I just want the money. And I don't even believe in climate change. I just <laughs> want the I want the, the financial opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's go back to th what I know more of, <laughs> and that is kind of the vegetation management sort of attributes and that sort of thing, the impacts. Um, these systems need to be, uh, generally need to be on fairly level land. So you'll see there are a number of installations um, in the Piedmont, and those are, because they have lots of good sun, but they also have rolling topography, and so they are... Uh, often developed with a fair amount of grading. And then you have the issues relative to water flow and infiltration and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, if you look at some of the, the maps on where solar is, you, you don't see a lot of solar in the Shenandoah Valley, probably in part because that's some of our prime farmland, but you also have a lot of even steeper topography, and then as you get into West Virginia, I was looking at some maps yesterday, there are no utility scale solar projects mm. uh, in West Virginia and a few other states uh, out west. Uh, and I think in West Virginia that's a largely topographically driven issue. But, you know, there are certainly cases where uh, the, not the landscaping, but the, the grading as it were, uh, was not adequate and they've, they've had issues with runoff and erosion. Um, you're also, when you have lots of disturbance, you can also move a lot of topsoil and that uh, subsoil that's left, or you know, maybe that's how it's graded out, is not the best for growing vegetation and so it becomes harder to vegetate, uh, to, to get grass back on it or that sort of thing. Um, can we grow wildflowers? Maybe. But wildflowers may be above the height of the lower edge of the panel. And then that's a problem because we don't want shade cast on the panels. We want to capture as much light as possible. So there are lots of different questions about how to best install these systems mm -hmm. so that they have the most environmental benefit or the least environmental impact. Um, so wildflowers may not be under the panels per se, but they might be out in the margins because there has to be area to, to travel and get around the, the panels for maintenance and that sort of thing. Um, well, this strikes me in another way. Isn't that the same kind of thing about the power lines or pipelines as it directions? What will it do to the habitat? Uh, the implications in terms of um, uh, runoff and things like that. Are they having those same kinds of discussion implemented? Because the government's involved in that. If I have a 100 acre farm, is there a lot of the quote government bureaucracies or 1,000 acres that really address those in a systematic way yeah, as so, we do with so, pipelines? So Virginia has a set of um, uh, standards that, that it wants people to, to follow and, and there is sort of a regulatory process. 
I'm not um, probably as well versed on some of that as I should be. I have a colleague who's been doing some work thinking about the community relations aspect of this, and I, I've uh, long felt that, you know, these systems are going to have impacts on rural communities, and I think our rural communities have struggled with uh, lack of access to good broadband and things like that. And so uh, I've been pleased to see that as some of these systems are coming into place, I think some companies are attentive to that and trying to think about what kind of resources can they bring back to the community because I think, you know, there are a lot of people who live in rural communities because they like the landscape, they like the, the view, they, they like not having to deal with a lot of other people. And they didn't sign on to that with the idea of having to look at a lot of solar panels. Uh, and if they feel like, well, this person is making a lot of money on that and these companies are making a lot of money on it and I'm just left looking at this stuff, that's uh, maybe painful. But if you say, well, you know, we're going to provide you know, a portion of, of a solar system at a community solar on houses at a reduced price, or we're going to put money back into school resources for your local school or something like that. I mean, to me, uh, maybe that's more communitarian than some people would like, but for me, it seems to me these systems probably could be more received more readily in rural communities if the whole community felt like they were getting some sort of benefit from it, as opposed to just one or two individuals who had the large land holding that were able to, to make a lot of money on the, on the solar lease. We only have um, three or four minutes or so remaining, um, which leads me to the notion, this is kind of increasing, look out five, six, years. where is this solar farming going? How do you see us? Because I am intrigued and actually more hope now that maybe there still could be some use of that land from an agriculture standpoint rather than just an either or. We had talked a little bit before, um, even beginning of the show, is that if I got a thousand acres, am I tempted by a developer, am I tempted by a data center, am I tempted by a mall or something, versus solar is there, but you could still, you're not taking land out of food production per se. So it gets kind of complicated. It, it, it is a little bit complicated. Um, and, you know, the technologies are changing all the time. Mm. Uh, so I was talking to an extension agent uh, recently who said that um, in his county, the supervisors hadn't really said no, but they hadn't said yes either because you know, there's, they have a lot of questions about uh, where these systems are going, what the technology will do, can, you know, in five years could the panels that we have at that time generate the same amount of power that you know in in half of this the space that sort of thing so there are a lot of questions there um and i think if you have a solar installation that's you know whatever that acreage is if the company feels that changing those panels out uh, makes economic sense because they're so much more efficient or capable or whatever in the future um, they'll do that I think, you know, we have a lot of energy demands. Um, and while solar is, I, I think it's less than 4% of our power production, but it's, it's gotten cheaper than, um, than natural gas at this point, as I, as I understand it, over the life of the uh, system. Mm. And so I think you're going to see continued... Uh, expansion of solar and, and more rapid expansion. Certainly government policy um, is leading us in that direction a, as the <coughs> investment becomes you know, more um, enticing because of government policy. Um, how all that plays out in five years or 10, I don't really, I don't have a crystal ball. And, uh, but, but I think that we need to be thinking about broadly about the the issues that we confront with climate change and with our power demand and with um, uh, you know there, there are even political realities that come with being beholden to somebody for for power if, if you don't control that that sort of thing so um, I think there are a number of reasons to be cautious but I think there are a number of reasons to be optimistic and um, I mean, we're trying to develop resources at this point that can help uh, homeowners and farmers, you know, give better consideration to, you know, what 
what should be done or what can be done with that land as a, if they want to get into solar in some way. Well, in the final minute, literally, that we have, if I've got a 500 acres, I'm curious about this. This is stimulated. What should they do? Where should they come? The yeah, yeah, so, would so I would, um, not would be, I do, no, I am not going to endorse any particular solar company. I, I think a good resource at this point, the American Farmland Trust mm -hmm. has uh, some information on solar um, and in the context of how do we integrate solar into our farm systems and what's the potential benefit for farm communities. And, and I think that they're um, probably going to be a fairly reasonable um, source of information at this point. Uh, I'm, my colleagues and I um, are not quite as far along as we would like to be with some of our extension publications. Uh, I, you know, I have heard of some challenges that farmers have faced in terms of, you know, I, okay, I started with this solar company, and then this solar company came and bought this one out, and, you know, after three or four, finally we got the thing installed, and, you know, so there, there can, there's a lot of churn in the industry. And uh, certainly it's not my place to make recommendations on who to talk to. In many cases, though, if your farm is well suited, that power company's probably already talked to you. Mm, interesting. Well, this is certainly going to be developing, and it's very interesting to make some of the distinctions there. Well, we're out of time. I'm sorry that we are, but I do want to thank my guest, John Fike, for joining me. And I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.